Lecture 4, Mastering the VETANA. In this lecture we will speak about the second tetrad of Anapanasati. These four steps deal with the feelings and are called Vedananyapasana, contemplation of feeling. The first two steps of this tetra take pity and sukha as the objects of our further study and detailed examination. 92. The practice of these steps develops out of the practice of the previous step. Once the body conditioner or breath is calmed, the feelings pity and sukha appear. Then, we take these very pity and sukha as the next objects or materials of our practice. 93. If we calm the kaya sankara, body conditioner, to the extent of jhana, the first jhana and so forth, then pity and sukha will be full and complete as factors of jhana. Nevertheless, if we are unable to reach jhana and are able only to calm the body conditioner partially, there is likely to be a degree of pity and sukha proportionate to the extent of that calming. Thus, even those who are unable to bring about jhana can still manage enough pity and sukha to practice these steps. 94. Here, we will study the characteristics and meanings of pity and sukha. Pity contentment arises due to our successfully making samadhi the previous steps, which means we were able to calm the body conditioner or breath. Contentment or satisfaction arises with this success. Once there is contentment you need not doubt that happiness sukha will follow. Due to satisfaction, joy arises. This is how we are able to get sufficient pity and sukha for the practice of steps 5 and 6. 95. PITI is not peaceful. The next thing to observe is that there are different levels to this word pity, such as contentment, satisfaction, and rapture. We must know these gradations of the more and less energetic forms of pity. The important quality of pity for you to be aware of is that it is not P-E-A-C-E-F-U-1. There is a kind of excitement or disturbance in the thing, called pity. Only when it becomes sukha is it tranquil. Pity has varying levels but all are characterized as stimulating, as causing the city to shake. Sukha is the opposite. It calms and soothes the mind. This is how pity and sukha differ. 96. So now we are ready to practice step 1 of the second tetrad, experiencing pity, P-I-T-I-P-A-T-S-A-M-V-E-D-I, -E which is contemplating pity every time we breathe in and breathe out. We must keep watching until we find the pity that arose when we succeeded in calming the body conditioner. Find out what this feeling is like. Fully experience it. Take it as the new object which the mind contemplates. The siddha is absorbed in contemplating it the same as if there was a kagata. The mind is absorbed with a single object pity. So far, we have contemplated a number of objects. The long breath, the short breath, all bodies, and calming the bodies. Now, we switch to pity. This pity has stimulating power. It makes the mind quiver, shake, and tremble. It should be easy for you to understand the various degrees of pity through the different English words we can use. How stimulating is contentment? How stimulating is satisfaction? And how stimulating is rapture? Go observe and find let by yourself. The mind focuses upon pity and fully experiences it every time there is an inhalation and every time there is an exhalation. This is the essence of the practice of step 5. 97. To put it most concisely, we breathe and experience pity with every breath. Breathing in and out, fully experience this feeling of contentment and simultaneously be aware of each in-breath and each out-breath. When this step is being practiced there is a very pleasant feeling of well-being. This work is fun to do, it is a most enjoyable lesson. Please try your best in this step. 98. Study the flavor of PITI. In each moment that we breathe with the experience of pity, we simultaneously study and train. Earlier, we trained and studied while breathing long, breathing short, and so forth. Now, study and train as pity is experienced in the mind. What is it like? Is it heavy? Is it light? How coarse is it? How subtle is it? This can be called, knowing what flavor it has. In particular, know what influence its flavor has on the mind or on the thoughts. Study in order to understand the nature of pity, just as we studied until understanding the nature of the breath during the practice of the previous tetrad. This is how to practice this step. 99. 
the most important thing to study and observe is the power pity has over the mind. What influence does pity have on the mind and thoughts? Carefully observe how the mind is when pity has not arisen. Once pity arises, what is this it like? What is the effect of a lot of pity? How is the mind when there is only a little pity? When pity is heavy, especially rapture, how much more does it stimulate the mind? Study the coarse kinds of pity, medium levels, and the finest types to see how they differ. Then, see how their influence upon the mind differs. This is the crucial point of this step of practice. L00. Finally, we realize that pity stimulates the mind in a coarse way. It does not have a refined and subtle effect like sukha, which we will look at next. In this step, understand the natures, facts, and secrets of this phenomenon known as pity. Observe its relationship to the mind until you are most familiar with this experience. 101. SUKHA soothes the mind. Now we come to the second step of this second tetrad, or step six overall, experiencing sukha, SUKHAPATISAMVEDI. In this step, we contemplate sukha happiness with every inhalation and exhalation. Focus on sukha in terms of it being the result arising out of pity. When pity has finished stimulating the siddha in pitta's coarse way, it loses energy. That is, it calms down and transforms into sukha. We will see that the two feelings are very different. The sukha does not stimulate or excite, rather it calms and soothes. Here we contemplate sukha as the agent which makes the siddha tranquil. Usually pity obscures sukha, but when pity fades away sukha remains. The coarse feeling gives way to the calm feeling. Taste the tranquil flavor of sukha with every inhalation and exhalation. This is the gist of step 6. 102. While contemplating sukha within the mind, we study and train just as we have done with the breath and with pity. How light is it? How heavy? How coarse is it? How subtle? How does it flavor awareness and experience? In Thai and Pali we use the word drink to describe this experiencing. Drink the flavor of sukha while breathing in and breathing out. At the same time, study its nature and truths. 103. It will be easy to see that when the power of pity appears, the breath will be rough. If the influence of sukha is evident, the breath will be fine. We even can say that when pity manifests its power, the flesh body is coarse. When sukha manifests its influence, the body calms down and becomes subtle. There are also effects on the siddha. When pity shows its power, it disturbs the mind proportionately, whereas the influence of sukha calms and relaxes the mind. The two feelings are opposites. This is what you must observe well at every opportunity, namely, with every in and out breath. 104. To summarize, once pity and sukha arise, they have different effects upon the breath. One will make it coarse, while the other makes it calm. They have different effects upon the body. One makes it coarse or agitated, while the other makes it calm. They have different effects upon the mind. One excites the mind while the other calms it. When you can catch or grasp or seize this distinction through your own experience of it, rather than merely thinking about it, you will have met with success in the practice of this step. 105. These might be some difficulties. While we are contemplate sukha, pity might interfere. It may take over such that the feel sukha disappears. Therefore, we must develop the ability to maintain that feeling for as long as we need and prevent pity from coming in. Pity is much more strong and coarse than sukha. If pity interferes, the contemplation of sukha is ruined and real tranquility does not arise. We must put forth superb effort in our contemplation of sukha so that it does not fade away. Do not let any other feelings interfere. In this step we should feel saturated with happiness. What a wonderful way to meet with success in the practice of step 6. 106. Experiencing the Mind Conditioner Now we come to step 7. Experiencing the Mind Conditioner C-I-T-T-S-A-N-K-H-A-R-A-P-A-T-I-S-A-M-V-E-V-I If we have completed step 6 successfully, then we know all about the feelings of pity and sukha. What does the arising of pity do to the siddha? What does the arising of sukha do to the siddha? What kind of thoughts does pity condition? 
What kind of thoughts does Sukha condition? We have noted and scrutinized these effects in steps 5 and 6. Once we come to step 7, it is easy to realize that, oh, pity and Sukha are mind conditioners. These Vedana are mind conditioners in the same way that the breath is the body conditioner. The method of study and observation is the same as in step 3. 107. We have observed that pity is coarse and excited, whereas Sukha is fine and peaceful. Thus, when pity conditions or brews up a thought, the thought is coarse. On the other hand, when Sukha brews up a thought, it is calm and tranquil. This is how we realize that the Vedana condition thoughts. Then we realize that the feelings condition both coarse thoughts and subtle thoughts. We call this activity conditioning the mind. 108. When pity is strong, it causes trembling in the body. And if it is very strong, the body might even dance or bounce with joy. This feeling is coarse and powerful. On the other hand, Sukha is calming, soothing, and relaxing. We learned that their characteristics are very different. When pity dominates the mind, it is impossible to think subtle thoughts. We feel a tingling all over. It makes the hair stand up all over our bodies. So we need to be able to control pity. Sukha, however, has advantages. It leads to tranquil, refined states. It can cause subtle, profound, and refined thoughts. It is as if these two feelings are opponents or foes. But that does not matter, for we know how to regulate them. We are able to control them by training according to the method we are now practicing. Just as much as to understand the CITTE Sankara reasonably well already. 109. Friends and Foes. Even so, we must observe and understand another, quite different secret. These two feelings must arise together. That is, if we are not contented or satisfied, happiness cannot occur. Contentment causes happiness, joy comes from satisfaction. This contentment and satisfaction is the set of things we call pity, the group of stimulating pleasant feelings. Although happiness and joy are the group of soothing feelings, still, they cannot exist without satisfaction. You can observe that in any event where there is happiness, satisfaction must always come before. Pity leads the way. Experiencing success we are satisfied, we are excited and disturbed by that success. Once pity loses strength, when the mind gets tired of all that agitation and excitement then sukha remains. The feeling calms down. So they are comrades at the same time that they oppose each other. They are comrades in that they must arrive together. There must be contentment first in order for there to be joy. We need to be careful about this. We must act toward them in an extremely subtle and refined way. It is like an art. It is a spiritual art to control pity and sukha so that they benefit our lives. This is the secret that we ought to know concerning pity and sukha. 110. By now we have discovered that pity is an enemy of vipassana, whereas sukha is not. Happiness joy is a friend or supporter of vipassana. Vipassana means seeing clearly, having direct insight into the truth of anikam, impermanence, dukkham, unsatisfactoriness and anatta, not self. We require a very refined mind to realize anikam, dukkham, and anatta through vipassana. Should pity arise, Vipassana is impossible. The mind gets all clouded and restless. Pity must be gotten rid of, for it is the enemy of Vipassana, of clear, subtle mental vision. Sukha, however, is not like that at all. Sukha soothes and calms, it makes the mind active and ready for Vipassana. For this reason, we must have the ability to regulate pity in Sukha. In the end, we will realize that the feelings, e.g., Pity and Sukha are mind conditioners. When pity conditions it, the Siddha is coarse and its thoughts are coarse, both the mind and the thoughts are coarse. When Sukha conditions or supports it, the Siddha is subtle and tranquil, and its thoughts are subtle and tranquil. Both feelings condition the mind, but from different angles. The Vedana are conditioners of the Siddha, thus they get the name, mind conditioner, CITTE Sankara. 112. When this fact is discovered, we contemplate it in the mind every time we breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out while becoming certain of this fact. This is the practice in step 7. 113. Calming the feelings. 
Step 8 is, calming the mind conditioners, pass MAIM citizen Kurum while breathing in and breathing out. Make the citizen Kurum, the Vedana, calm and peaceful. Lessen their energy while breathing in and lower their energy while breathing out. First, we must be able to calm the feelings, only then can we experience this every time we breathe in and out. 114. Various ways of lessening the strength of the Vedana exist. Lowering their energy or stopping them completely is not only possible, it must be done. There are two approaches for us to use, the Samadhi concentration method and the Pana wisdom method. 115. The concentration method. Pitta's impulse can be calmed with the Samadhi method, which is to develop a higher level of concentration in order to remove pity and sukha from what is felt. We probably are not able to do this yet, because we have only just begun our training. Still, there is the secret that these feelings can be gotten rid of by making a higher level of Samadhi, such as the third or fourth jhana. Or, we could do it even by changing our thought. Bring another kind of thought into the mind to intervene and suppress that satisfied feeling. Either activity uses the power of Samadhi. The power of another type of Samadhi shuts off Pitta's energy in particular. Generally, it is not necessary to get rid of Sukha. In fact, we ought to preserve it as a support of further practice. Here, we especially need to control Pitta. We can control it with Samadhi techniques either by changing mind's object or by having a higher degree of concentration or jhana. Either will calm down pity. 116. Or, we might say that we bring in the true meaning of the word samadhi to drive away pity. The real meaning of samadhi is having ekaggatacitta with nibbana as its object. We have already explained that ekaggatacitta is the mind gathered together into one pinnacle or peak. True samadhi has nibbana or santi, spiritual tranquility, as its object. We can recall what genuine samadhi is like. Now that pity causes complications, disturbances, and difficulties, chase it away. We do not want it and we do not need it. We aim at the one pinnacled mind that has Santi or Nibbana as its object. The feeling of pity dissolves because we do not want it anymore. This is a skillful means that uses Samadhi to drive away pity. 117. The Wisdom Method now we come to the method that uses Pana wisdom to diminish the strength of pity, to eradicate the influence of pity, or even of Sukha if we wish. We use the Pana that realizes the true nature, characteristics, qualities, conditions of all things to know what pity arises from and due to what cause it will cease. Pity bubbles up when a satisfying, correct condition is achieved. It must cease due to the lack of that condition, due to realizing that it is illusory, that it is not real. Once we see wisely in this way, the feeling of being agitated by pity will abate. Another wisdom method is to see the asada and adanava of pity. As Asada is a thing's attractive quality, its charm that deliciously tempts the heart. Pity has an enchanting flavor. Adanava is a thing's wicked punishment. The adanava of pity is the fact that it excites and disturbs, that it drives away tranquility, that it is the phobe of vipassana. Once we realize this, pity dissolves. If we see its arising, ceasing, charm, and wickedness, then it dissolves, then it disappears. This is to drive off pity with a pana technique. 118. Every one of us should understand well the meaning of the word as seda and adenabla. If you can remember the Pali, that is even better than the English translations. As said it is the attractive, satisfying, lovely, infatuating quality or charm of something. Aden Ava is the lowliness or wickedness of a thing. There is no excuse for us to be deceived by these two. Once we see them we will know that getting pleased by and falling in love with anything is positive foolishness. To go and hate something is negative foolishness. If we know these two well, that they constantly deceive us and lure us into loving and hating, then they will teach us that we must not indulge in liking and disliking, and we will be freed from the power of things. For example, Mani has both as Seda and Adenabla. Once we know both of them, we will not be misled by or go crazy about money. To completely understand this pair is the safest thing we can do. Know the as Seda and Adenabla of pity and you will get sick of pity. 
it will flee by itself. This is how to use the wisdom method to chase away pity. Even sukha should not be indulged. Although we may save some sukha for a beneficial purpose, we do not get lost in it. Please remember these two words for the rest of your lives. Then they will become the kind of charm that protects, a talisman that truly protects, rather than endangers. 119. At this point now, the mind can regulate the feelings. It has developed the kind of mastery and self-control where the feelings no longer have the power to drag us this way or that. The Sukhavidana, the pleasant feelings we have been discussing here, pull the mind in an agreeable direction, in a positive way. There is another set of Vidana that pull us in a negative way, in an undesirable, dissatisfying direction. We already have talked about the group of pleasant feelings. We need to be aware of these feelings which are unpleasant, the D-U-K-K-H-A-V-E-D-A-N-A, also. We must know how to keep these feelings of displeasure and unhappiness from dragging us into a state of Dhaka. They can be defeated with the same method as used on pity. Whether happy feelings or unhappy feelings, we can control them all. We become controllers of all feelings without exception. We practice by bringing any Vedana into the mind and experiencing it fully. Then we scrutinize it with Pana to drive that feeling away. Experience this ability to get rid of any kind of Vedana. Know that the feelings cannot condition the it anymore. Rehearse this technique with every inhalation and exhalation until deft and expert at it. Thus, you will meet with success in the practice of Step 8. 120. Why bother? One last point to consider is the question of why we bother talking so much about the feelings. Why is it necessary to include them in this line of practice? Why not hurry on to Vipassana and get to Nibbana as fast as possible? The reason is that we must understand the Vedana and be able to regulate them in order to control the mind as our practice continues on to the realization of the path fruitions, M-A-G-G-A-P-H-L-A-N-I-B-B-A-N-A, which is our primary purpose. We have a special secondary purpose, also. That is once we can regulate the feelings we will be able to keep life on the correct path. When we are foolish about the Vedana we fall under the power of and become slaves to materialism, which always happens when we indulge in material pleasures, that is, the flavors of feelings. All the crises occurring in this world have their origin in people not understanding the Vedana, giving in to the Vedana, and being enamored with the Vedana. They entice us to act like this, which leads to disagreements, quarrels, conflicts and eventually war. Sometimes they lead even to world wars. All because people suffer defeat through the deceptions of Vedana. By now you ought to realize that the feelings must be understood. We must know their secrets and manage to regulate them if there is to be peace in this world. There is no need to talk about realizing Nibbana when merely living on this planet in peace within ourselves and with others, which requires that we able to control the feelings, is more than we can manage now. I hope that you all will take advantage of this ability for the rest of your lives. This tetrad has been included in the practice of Anupanasati due to the great power and importance of the Vedana. So this is the second tetrad of Anupanasati. We have used up all our time today and must end the lecture here. 121. Lecture 5. Contemplating the CITTE.